uh, Oscar winner Hungarian director Laszlo Nemes declared, uh, I quote, this work of mine is about the birth of the 20th century, the turn of civilization after the 19th century promises, colorfulness and development into a self-destructive mode has preoccupied me for a very long time. I am not interested in politics, but I am looking more deeply in the human psyche for the process leading the world from the zenith directly to the darkness of the night." And, uh, of quote. Visually designed as a contrast between elegant and decorative interiors, a hat saloon and loud and chaotic unidentifiable cityscapes of a beginning of 20th century Budapest, as well as uh, deserted rural settings, the essence of this unlikely costume drama can be reduced to a meaningful remark of a protagonist. Hats behind a lot of beauty, the monstrosity of the world. The film about an orphan girl returning to Budapest to work in the hat saloon of her parents who died under uh, unclarified circumstances just to find herself in the middle of an identity quest launched by contradictory news about an infamous brother of whom she did not know also thematizes the psychological dangers of too many and confusing visual details and the too close <coughs> looking and contemplation. Nemes <coughs> intentionally undermines the big narrative form of epic drama by providing insufficient and confusing visual traces and relying on gossip and news, mostly auditory information about an imminent uh, political conspiracy at the highest level. The effect of uh, the desperate obsessive quest of the brother is visually represented by uh, the close-ups of Iris, her gaze revealing a state of mind that balances on the brink of insanity, paired with the haptic quality uh, of the image. As Schopenhauer has rightly observed, uh, this is a quote, just as the eye, when it gazes for a long time at one object, it soon not, is soon not able to see it distinctly any longer, because the outlines run into one another, become confused, and finally everything becomes obscure. So also through long continued rumination on one thing, our thinking gradually becomes confused and dull, and ends up uh, ends in complete stupor. End of uh, quote. The correlation between an altered visual perception and overloaded mind and subjectivity is also suggested by the female protagonist's name. Iris has a double meaning, denotes both a flower and a part of the eye, a thin circular structure responsible for controlling the diameter and size of the pupil, and thus the amount of light reaching the retin retin retina. Uh, Iris is the eye of the film, who at the beginning seems to look but not see, uh, then looks uh, too closely just to lose the object of her vision, which triggers a temporary loss of herself, a disintegration of subjectivity. As uh, the name Iris uh, is as the iris is responsible for the size of the pupil, the name uh, indi indirectly points at another correlation, that between fission and fear. Iris knows and understands very little and sees too much, just like the ordinary man of the turn of the 20th century, suddenly overwhelmed by a maze of visual uh, details, a circumstance that leads to the gradually increasing response of the film. In fact, the storyline of Sunset follows in many respects that of a detective story merged with an identity quest of the female protagonist that turns into an allegory of a national identity quest. The most frequently uh, obsessively asked questions in the film are, where is he? And where have you been? But the vision of Iris, just like her hearing, is limited. When uh, we uh, often see her behind doors, uh, windows, and curtains or peeping through niches, only overhearing fragments of conversations. Just like the 20th century Dutch uh, uh, genre uh, painting, uh, 
paintings depicting peeping and eavesdropping people, the emphasis is often on another sense that vision, than vision, that of hearing, as if suggesting the directorial standpoint that cinema has exhausted its visual possibilities in conveying narratives, giving way to oral experimentation and immersion. Sunset is rich in images framing the female characters, character in painterly compositions and portraits authenticating the story uh, by contemporary visual culture forms and details, use of frames and lights. But the images loaded with visual details, fashion items, mostly hats, become also part of a pseudo-detective story in which clues and traces are being intently sought, but do not take Iris closer to the solution of the political puzzle, a possible conspiracy leading to the First World War. The few scenes presenting pastoral landscapes beyond being based on the classic nature, uh, culture, civilization opposition are based uh, on, uh, I quote, the incongruity between the beauty of the photographic frames and the themes of violence, as Agnes Petter puts it. Uh, the killing of the alleged uh, brother by Iris happens in a pastoral setting on the river at uh, sunrise, in this scene, the image of nature does not appear as a landscape that could be contemplated from a safe distance, but a blurred, haptic environment surrounding her closely to convey her fear that traps her in her own body. When she later returns to the same uh, place, and this is the, after the scene of killing, completely the body completely merging with the natural background. When she later returns to the same place, she finds a spotless uh, uh, landscape, calm and distant. The immersive landscape, thoroughly involved in the act of killing, now appears as a painterly object of contemplation, a picture concealing the traces of violence. The two experiences of the natural setting correspond to the difference between immersion, that is, a lived experience, and contemplation, respectively. Situated between proximity and distance, body and mind, sensuous immersion and detached observation, this contrasting representation reiterates the question of anthropologist John Wiley, whether landscape is a world we are living in or a scene we are looking at from afar. In the scene of killing, nature almost merges with, becomes an extension of Iris's body and sensorium, and an accomplice by taking in the corpse floating away in the river. In contrast, in the second scene of the return, this setting is already framed as a landscape, a quiet, distant surface on which the protagonist's sense of guilt is projected. This, of course, raises the question if a lived immersive landscape, uh, the lack of the, the frame, uh, uh, can be uh, considered landscape at all. Uh, I argue that uh, Nemesh's experimentation, experimentation with the natural picturesque as opposed to and as an effect of an overwhelming or urban modernity can be placed within the tradition of contemporary noir or uh, pseudo-noir films, TV series, in which landscapes become silent witnesses of human brutality fed by unspoken social tensions of modern uh, welfare societies. In order to emphasize the social or political implications of murders framed by landscapes, I will introduce the concept of guilty landscape, which refers to a pastoral setting presented as idyllic, inviting, and peaceful that becomes the scene of a horrible crime and in the process loses its innocence. As such, it turns into a metaphor of the degeneration of a society and civilization. This is a term that has been used before in crime fiction criticism by Reindorf and Stix.tir to capture the topophilic desire of crime novels, literary tourists, readers and TV viewers for the particular Nordic criminal peripheries. It is a fitting figure in the description of an intriguing phenomenon, namely that comparatively non-violent, peaceful, harmonious welfare states are producing what appears to be an unsustainable surplus of violent crime fiction.
As Ryan Ders points out, the term guilty landscape was introduced by Dutch artist and writer Armando to describe the landscape surrounding concentration camps. Uh, as he puts it, I quote, the natural beauty was so luxuriant that it seemed impossible that the murder and torture could have taken place here. But the woods around the concentration camp had, had witnessed horrible war crimes and were, according to Armando, accomplices. They constituted, in other words, a guilty landscape, end of quote. Uh, Reinders reiterates the term uh, for the Utoya mass murder in Norway in 2011, uh, when the island became the ultimate image of a, a society worst uh, nightmare, the killing of its children. The film Utoya July 22 presents a landscape, an insensitive Nordic pine forest that does not provide shelter for the groups of children who need to split up in order to save themselves. The isolating nature of a national landscape, uh, the island with pine forest, participates in a social allegory of a welfare society that individualizes and isolates equally nurtures potential perpetrators and victims. Intriguingly, the killing of innocents in a natural setting has been a recurring topic, recurring topic of um, Nordic crime fiction, uh, novels, films and TV series in the last at least two decades. In novels like uh, The Island, Springtime, The Snowman and Blood on Snow, just to name a few, and their fiction and TV film adaptations, the Nordic landscapes as national landscapes with fjords, seaside, forests, islands, and snow became complex allegories, vehicles for, projection, for projections, projections of community emotions, most often the sense of guilt. And for example, the British TV drama Broadchurch follows uh, in the footsteps of the same Nordic tradition of guilty landscape at its center with the monumental seaside rocky wall, West Bay in Dorset, under which the 12 years uh, old boy is found dead at the beginning of the story. Uh, relying on the static tradition of steel media art, both painting and photography, this series often starts with a landscape that signifies a view of nature emancipated from the presence of human figures and offering itself for contemplation. They, they use uh, Tom, uh, Tom Moore, uh, long takes and relative stillness in the depiction of often empty natural spaces framing the dead body before the quest and investigation is launched and the photographic turns into cinematic. Martin Lefebvre finds that empty photographic landscapes can look, uh, I quote, deserted like the scene of a crime. As he argues, paradoxically, however, this crime scene is haunted by the memory of those very characters, actions and events, those narrative components that have been chased from the visual field in noir uh, films and TV series. Recurrence due to, obsessive, to the obsessive return of protagonists, detectives, family members, even that of the murderer to the crime scene, confers temporality and the cinematic quality to the still landscape. The landscape becomes a site of memory, a mnemonic presence, as Lefebvre would put it. In an anthropolo anthropological approach, uh, this mnemonic quality belongs to the very nature of the landscape. In uh, Tim Ingold's words, I quote, to perceive a landscape is to carry out an act of remembrance, and remembering is not so much a matter of calling up an internal image stored in the mind as of engaging perceptually with an environment that is itself pregnant with the past, end of quote. The perception of landscape as an act of remembrance is beautifully thematized in another pseudo-noir, the Turkish uh, Nurin Bilgec Ceylan's Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. Entering in a dialogue with the Western genre, already with its very title alluding to Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West, this film greatly relies on the figurative potential of spectacular landscape as witness of human brutality. Set in Anatolia, Turkey, the film is the one-night story of a murder investigation. 
willing to close a murder case as soon as possible, a group composed from a, of a doctor, a prosecutor, a few policemen and a driver are taking a confessing murderer to the place where he buried the corpse. Uh, visibly under shock and in a state of confusion, he only remembers two distinguishing, distinguish, distinguishing landmarks of the crime scene, a spring and a tree. But in the dark, all landscapes seem similar and potential crime scenes. The quest starts in the evening and lasts all night long, gradually turning into an inner journey for each of the protagonists and uh, the natural uh, setting becomes a witness to their confessions. Uh, the, the prosecutor speaks about the unusual cir circumstances of the death of his wife and we find out the divorce about the divorce of the doctor that leading to his self-exile to this remote place. The crime scene, a landscape with the shallow grave guard, guard, guarded uh, by a black dog and found only in the morning is thus not only a guilty landscape that hid the traces, but also a landscape of guilt that effaces a narration for a moment, becomes immersive and loaded with symbolic personal meanings for both the protagonists and spectators. In this difference, we can grasp uh, Martin Lefebvre's dif distinction between intentional landscape composed by the director um, intentionally and uh, the so-called impure landscape. In the case of this letter, uh, the spectator can still direct his, his or her attention toward the landscape in such a way as to momentarily break the narrative bond and fill it up with subjective content. Embedded, uh, embedded in a uh, pseudo-detective story, in this film, landscape seems to require a form of contemplative autonomy, a severing of narrative subservience, while on the other hand, it seems to acquire its significance rel relative to our ability to immerse. Just like in Sunset, in Once uh, Upon a Time in Anatolia, immersion in the sun, in the landscape, is occasionally conveyed through the hapticity of the image of tempered with a soundscape of noises from the nature. What has been traditionally regarded as natural expressionism, the style of Ceylan's outdoor scene, ha uh, scenes harks back explicitly to that of Andrei Tarkovsky, appears here as an emotional fusion with nature revealing deep existential crises. More specifically, the crisis of masculinity is conveyed by a fusion of very different aesthetic approaches to landscape from two different cinematic traditions, the distant panoramic cinemascope views of the Western film genre and the landscape animated by the sensorium and uh, emotions of uh, struggling subjectivity more characteristic of European modernism. This resonates with Line's previous films in which geographical distance, uh, the depiction of distant uh, spectacular landscapes becomes a signifier of an insurmountable alienation between people. See, for example, distant climates or winter sleep. Um, to sum up, um, my argumentation has followed two main lines. The first one analyzed the experimentation of Hungarian director Nemes Laszlo's film with the big epic form in terms of an opposition between the visible and audible on the one hand, and an opposition between a visually loaded or urban environment of the first dec decades of modernity and an isolated landscape susceptible to become a scene of brutality on the other. The second line introduced the term of guilty landscape in relation with the tradition of detective fiction in order to describe our impure perception of criminal natural settings, that is, our tendency to confer symbolical existential meanings to landscape in film. I also propose the term landscape of guilt to describe a landscape permeated by emotional projection of the protagonist and the spectator identifying with him. Either distant or close, these landscapes of real or pseudo-noirs serve not only to host our thoughts, as Merleau-Ponty has put it, but also to sublimate our innermost emotions of fear and guilt. Thank you very much for your attention.